Battle Dress by Amy Efa, Chapter 2, Monday, June 28th, 9.01 a.m. My watch said 9.01 as we climbed the bleachers of Mitchie Stadium. The morning was heating up and it was going to be a hot day. A tall cadet stood on a platform below wearing a white hat, a white short sleeve shirt, white gloves, gray pants, a red sash wrapped around his waist, a silver saber at his hip, and shiny black shoes. He briefed the new cadet candidates and their families. I tried to listen to his motivating speech, but my mind was spinning. I can't believe I'm really here. My mother nudged me and said loud enough for the people all around us to hear, It's a good thing you dumped that ugly boyfriend of yours. Maybe now you can get a cute hunk like that one down there. What boyfriend? I glared at her. The ugly boyfriend she referred to was nothing more than a guy on my track team who had asked me to the movies. Twice. The second time, he got to experience one of my mother's verbal assaults for dropping me off five minutes late. There wasn't a third time. You now have a few minutes to take care of your farewells, the cadet announced. Afterward, all new cadet candidates will file down the steps where they will be received by the cadet cadre. While the candidates are in processing, friends and family are invited to participate in an orientation and a bus tour of West Point. And later this afternoon, you will be able to see your candidates once again as they march onto the plane for the oath ceremony. We encourage everyone to attend. Thank you and good luck. The people around us rose out of their seats, arms wrapped around bodies, hands squeezed tissues, cameras flashed. I stood and looked for my red duffel bag. My mother started crying. She's only 17, Ted, she told my dad. She's not ready for this. My dad cleared his throat and began in inspecting his stubby fingernails. You're going to be so far away, my mother wailed. Thank God. She planted a wet kiss on my cheek and clung to me. Unaccustomed to her embrace, I pulled away. So instead, she began patting the top of my head like I was a five-year-old, going off to school for the first time. I'll write you every day. You know I'll do that, don't you, Andy? I nodded and forced down the lump that was forming in my throat. Don't start crying now, you idiot. Didn't she say only a couple days ago that she was glad to see you go? You want to leave. Mandy hugged me. Just think, you could be coming with us to Niagara Falls, she whispered. I laughed. I'll miss you she said. Me too, I whispered back, and I meant it. Out of all the members of our family, she was the only one I hated to leave. Randy shoved my sister out of the way. You can always come back home, you know, he said, rolling his eyes. Then he gave me an obligatory hug and reattached his headphones to his ears. I glanced at my dad. He was now engrossed in picking at a hangnail. New cadet candidates, said the cadet. Please file down the steps at this time. I wiped my hands on my jeans, then picked up my duffel bag and took a long, slow breath. Well, I guess I'd better go, Dad. I bit the inside of my lip and hesitated a moment before turning toward the steps. Uh, Andy, my dad said. I turned around. He jiggled the change in his pockets, looking as uncomfortable as a new kid in the lunchroom. I almost felt sorry for him. Almost. Good luck, he said, and gave me an awkward hug. Take care. Thanks. I jogged down the white cement steps. I didn't look back. I followed the other new cadets into a dark tunnel beneath the stadium. A cadet pointed where to go. I looked at him. Our eyes met. I smiled. Hi. Don't say hi to me, miss, he shouted. What do I look like, your boyfriend? Keep your head and eyes to the front and walk with a sense of purpose. I moved quickly past him. What's his problem? Fall in directly behind the maggot in front of you, bellowed another cadet further ahead. The tunnel amplified his already ear-splitting volume. All the new cadets stopped for a second, unsure of what to do. Move it! We quickly shuffled into a single file line. New cadets, the cadet continued. You will keep your head and eyes to the front. You will address all male upper class cadets as sir. You will address all female upper class cadets as ma'am. You will not speak unless spoken to. Do you understand? He was answered by a handful of mumbled yeses and yes sirs. Pop off, he hollered. Pop off? Nobody moved. You maggots are stupider than soap scum. When you are asked a question, you will respond immediately and in a motivated manner. Do I make myself clear? Yes, sir, we all yelled in unison. You are no longer little boys and girls. You are new cadets, subhuman maggots, douchebags, grosser than pond water, not fit to lick the filth from under my grandmother's toenails. Do you understand? Yes, sir. I say again, do you understand? Yes, sir. I was sure that our response shook the stadium's very foundation and that within seconds, hundreds of hysterical parents would come rushing in to see what had caused it. The cadet yelled for us to follow him. The other subhuman maggots and I continued through the tunnel until we reached three more cadets seated at a table, spaced at equal distances from each other. The one in the middle barked, State your name, smack. I froze. Who, me? My eyes shot left then right. Yes, you, knucklehead. What's your name? I stumbled up to him. Um, Andy. I mean, Andrea. Andrea Davis. He leaned forward and glared at me, his eyes tiny slits. You will answer all questions in complete sentences, dirtbag. He leaned back in his chair. Let's try it again, shall we? What is your name? 
He spoke softly, but there was no comfort in his tone. I swallowed. My spit was thick. My name is Andrea Davis. Sir, he said. I hesitated. Yes, sir. Sir, my name is Andrea Davis, sir. No sandwich, sirs, he screamed. For morons like you, that means only one sir per sentence. He rifled through a pile of papers, slammed a tag down in front of me and roared, fill out that tag and attach it to your bag. I grabbed the pen in front of him and scrawled my name in the appropriate places, but I was shaking so much I didn't think anyone would be able to read it. Then he dismissed me. I hurried with my bag back into line. New cadets, boomed a voice from my right. My eyes jerked immediately in his direction. You will have exactly two minutes to relieve yourselves. The female latrine is directly to your rear and the male latrine is directly to your front. I highly suggest that you take this opportunity. Two minutes. Move out. We sprinted in those two directions as if we were fleeing from a burning building. 1001, 1002, I sprang into a stall fumbling with my jean zipper, my heart pounding and hands shaking. 1033, 1034, I pulled down my underpants and stared at them in disbelief. Not today. One minute remaining, boomed the cadet. I started rummaging through my duffel bag. Underwear, bras, makeup, hairbrush, alarm clock. Oh, where are they? 45 seconds. Running shoes, toothbrush, tampons. I ripped open the box and grabbed two. 30 seconds. The sound of toilets flushing echoed in the tunnel. I added mine to the chorus, jamming the remaining tampon into my pocket, grabbed my bag, and flew out of the bathroom, adrenaline charging through my veins. If you're not back in my line, new cadets, you're wrong! A couple of miserable souls straggled to the end of the line. Three white hats descended on them like pigeons on popcorn. I followed the other new cadets out of the bowel of the stadium and onto a bus. I sank into a wide, soft seat beside a cute, blonde-haired guy wearing a football jersey. Any other time, I would have smiled at him. But as the bus pulled away from Mitchie Stadium, he looked out the window, and I stared at the floor. The bus was so quiet, you could almost hear the sweat squeezing out of our pores. The bus stopped in front of a huge brown brick building. Another cadet was waiting there. At this time, you will in process. His voice was loud and confident, but lacked the fierceness of the cadets in the stadium. He ordered us to form a single file line and enter the building. My eyes took their time adjusting to the dimness as I followed the others down a dark, quiet hallway. Then we entered a huge gym filled with other new cadet candidates and rows and rows of tables. I filled out forms and signed paperwork. I opened an account at the Pentagon Federal Credit Union. I turned in my medical files from my doctor back home. I got my chest, waist, hips, and inseam measured. Then I received my first uniform and was sent into a dingy but clean locker room to shed my jeans and t-shirt and don the uniform. A chubby middle-aged woman guarded the locker room door. Leave your bag after you change, she said. I didn't talk to the only other girl in the room as I pulled off my clothes and shoved them into my bag. She finished tying her shoes at the same time that I did, and as we stood, I looked at her and she looked at me. Even though she was about four inches shorter than I, we were mirror images of each other. A white crew neck undershirt, long black athletic shorts with white army emblazoned on the left thigh, black knee socks, black shoes. We giggled. If my friends could see me now, she said, rolling her eyes. The woman shook her head and motioned for us to pull the knee socks up to our knees. Then she placed a tiny beaded metal chain with a card around my neck and pinned two tags, one green and one yellow, connected by a string to the elastic waistband of my shorts. The tags hung nearly to my knees. What are these for? I didn't have a chance to ask. Go on out the door now, hon, she said, and get in the line to get weighed. A soldier in an army uniform took my height, 67 inches, and my weight, 121 pounds, and sent me into another line to do pull-ups. More like pull-up. One. Then I got into more lines. I picked up a pair of prescription glasses with brown plastic frames. I got stabbed with syringes. I filled out more forms, and each time, the card around my neck was scanned, and a check mark was added to one of my tags. Finally, I ended up in another smaller gym with wooden bleachers lining both sides. A cadet inspected my tags and told me to find my bag and wait in the section of the bleachers marked H. I eventually spotted my duffel bag and carried it to the bleachers. Three guys were already there, lounging and laughing about three rows up, but I sat down in the first row alone. I checked my watch, 1027. Had only one and a half hours passed since I was sitting in the stadium with my family. Unbelievable. I took a deep breath. Just relax. I think the worst is over. The past hour hadn't been anything like those first ten minutes. That must have been the initiation. I closed my eyes. Where do you boys think you are? Summer camp? Bellowed a deep voice, jarring me like a telephone call in the middle of the night. I will not tolerate any smoking and joking in my bleachers. His voice reverberated through the gym, making me feel like he was standing inside my brain. I didn't dare look at the guys on the third row. I didn't have to. I knew they were no longer lounging or laughing. The cadet's eyes slowly rolled over the H section bleachers 
features and locked with mine. They were blue-gray, the exact color of Lake Michigan on a cloudy day. On your feet, he roared. We sprang up like jack-in-the-boxes. Pick up your bags and follow me. Since I had no bleachers to scramble down, I was the first in line. The cadet was tall and lean and looked like he could have easily stepped off the set of a Hollywood war flick. His uniform was crisp and bright, as was everything else about him. The Hollywood hero led us out of the gym and across a huge quadrangle that rang with the booms of battle, roaring voices, and the boom, boom, boom of a beating drum resounding from the gray granite walls enclosing it. The cadet walked effortlessly, but I had to run to keep up with him. Once he looked over his shoulder at me and hissed, Carry yourself in a military manner, miss. No double timing in my formation. Double timing? This is North Area, he yelled as we scampered behind him. Remember it. The Hollywood hero finally stopped us near a tunnel that went through a building several stories high. I could see green grass on the other side. You will enter this sally port, he said, gesturing toward the tunnel, and report to the cadet in the red sash. You will present arms. Salute him. He eyed the four of us with disgust and asked, Do any of you maggots know which hand to salute with? The guy to my left raised his hand and cried out, I do. The cadet lunged toward him and snarled, You are no longer in kindergarten, moron. You have four responses and four responses only. Yes, sir. No, sir. No excuse, sir. And sir, I do not understand. Then he stepped back and yelled, do you pea brain scum sucking low life grub balls understand? Yes, sir. Then let's hear it. What are your four responses? It took us about half a dozen tries to memorize our four responses correctly and in order. But when we did, the cadet actually smiled a close up toothpaste smile. His snow white black visored cap gleamed in the sun and looked like a halo on his head. I smiled back. I couldn't help myself. I regretted it immediately. Smirk off, smack! His spit sprinkled my face, and it suddenly occurred to me that he hadn't used his close-up any time recently. I'm not your boyfriend, chucklehead, and I'm not your friend. I'm not your mama or daddy or big brother. Save your smiles for the mirror, because that's the only place they'll be welcome here. I could feel my throat tighten and my mouth go dry. He turned from me and addressed the four of us. You maggots make me want to puke. My old granny is more together than you worthless scumbags and she's dead. We all started to shake like a washer on the spin cycle with an uneven load. Now you will report to the cadet in the red sash. You will salute like this. He placed his right hand at the brim of his hat and said, You will sound off and say, Sir, new cadet X reports to the cadet in the red sash as ordered. Do you understand? Yes, sir. Post, he barked. No one moved. The cadet blinked. What are you, a, a gaggle of halfwits? Post means you move with a sense of purpose to your appointed destination. You got that, idiots? Yes, sir. Then, post! We hurried toward the sally port and waited in a single file for our turn to be called forward by the cadet in the red sash. I was standing on the dividing line between the sweltering brightness of the squad that the Hollywood hero had called the North Area and the cool dimness of the sally port. A light breeze blew through the tunnel, relieving my sweat-streaked skin. The person ahead of me turned around, another girl. She had short curly hair, and when she leaned toward me, I could see freckles sprinkled across the bridge of her nose. So what do you think, she whispered. I shook my head. I had no words to explain what I was thinking. So? An upper-class cadet was standing right beside us, his hands on his hips and a thin smile on his lips. You two ladies old friends? We both relaxed. No, we just met in line, the girl said. Oh, just getting acquainted, huh? How so very nice, he said. It looks like you both are in H Company. Maybe you'll be roommates. We looked at each other and smiled. There's only one problem, though, ladies. I watched his lips as he talked. Saliva, dried and white, stuck to the corners of his mouth. I'm in H Company, too. Then his smile fell into a hard line, and the hard line changed into a huge oval. Why are you talking in my line? Relaxation fled, muscles stiffened, and somehow we stuttered. N -n no excuse, sir. He glared at me. I felt as if he could see right through my eyes and down into my soul. I saw you gazing around, boneheads. His face twisted into an angry scowl. New cadets are not authorized to gaze around. Keep your greasy little heads and beady little eyes straight ahead. Then he smirked. But I'll indulge you with one last luxury. He pointed to his name tag. Look, admire, memorize. Five white letters screamed at us out of their shiny black background, daily. Easy to remember, ladies. Just think of me as your daily nightmare. Then he grabbed our tags and read our names out loud. Davis, Martin, he glared into our faces. You better remember me because believe me, I'll remember you. Goosebumps sprouted all over my body. I don't know what you think this place is, ladies, but you better learn quick. This ain't no Sesame Street. This is the Pain Palace. And if you don't like it, I will personally escort you out the front gate. And with that, 
He was gone. The girl turned around. I kept my eyes fixed on the back of her head. I did not think of anything until it was my turn on the chopping block. Drop your bag! The cadet in the red sash roared as I approached him. I placed my red duffel bag on the ground. He looked at me as if I were covered in vomit. You will perform all tasks in a military manner, miss. Now, pick it up. I reached down and picked it up. Drop your bag. I dropped it, clunk, and winced, thinking of the clarinet inside that my mother made me bring. Miss, you will immediately execute at my command. Pick up your bag. The shouts in the sally port were deafening. I could hear bags dropping to my left and right. I wasn't the only new cadet playing hot potato with my bag. Now, new cadet, drop your bag and report. I dropped it and shouted, Sir, uh, new cadet Davis, um, is reporting... I mean, reports to the cadet in the red sash on order. I winced. As ordered? I held my breath and then squeaked. Sir? I watched him, waiting for his wrath to erupt. He was taller than anyone in the sally port, I was certain. The features of his face were smooth, almost comforting, like hot chocolate on a snowy day. Not bad, he said. You forgot to salute. Try it again. I stared at him. A second chance? I say again, new cadet, you forgot to salute. I flung my hand in the direction of my temple, as the Hollywood hero had shown me and shouted, Sir, new cadet Davis reports to the cadet in the red sash as ordered. He nodded and saluted back. Drop your salute after you see me drop mine, new cadet. His arm fell to his side, so I copied him. Simon says, kindergarten after all. He inspected my tags and said, new cadet Davis, you are assigned to cadet basic training company H. On my command, you will enter the doorway to my right, your left. Take the stairs to the third floor. There you will report to the first sergeant of H company. Do you understand, new cadet Davis? I'd figure it out. Yes, sir. Good. Post. I grabbed my bag and took off for the stairwell. That wasn't so bad. Miss! Halt! Oh no, what now? I stopped and turned around. Yes, sir? You forgot to salute. Post on back here and try it again. Yes, sir. I retraced my steps, stood in front of him, and dropped my bag at my feet. I raised my shaking right hand to my throbbing temple. Did I tell you to drop your bag, new cadet? No, sir. Way to go, Andy. Initiative is not invited here during Beast, new cadet. Beast, is that what they call this? The name was perfect. You'd best do only as you're told. He raised his hand, and I waited for him to drop it. I could have sworn his left eyelid fluttered ever so briefly before he said, Pretty weak salute there, new cadet. Post. My hand fell with his and snatched my bag. I fled for the stairs. Did the cadet in the red sash actually wink at me? 10.51 a.m. A howl as harsh as the winter wind greeted me as I entered the stairwell. Another cadet. Neck back, smack. Take the steps one at a time. Keep your forearms parallel to the ground. At all times when indoors, you will slither along the wall like a snake. I don't want your stinking carcass anywhere near me. And move out. Got that smack? Yes, sir, I yelled, trying to obey these complicated orders while following the stinking carcass ahead of me. Then he tripped over one of the steps, and the weight of his bag slung over his shoulder threw him backward. He grabbed the railing. I shoved my bag into his back to help him stay up. Who's that spazzing around in my stairwell? Growled another voice from the first landing above us. I pulled my bag back. The voice's owner, a stocky cadet, looked like a troll who had just crawled out from under some bridge. He bounded down the stairs and bellowed at the sprawled new cadet. You, bean smack, knucklehead, trying to take out a classmate? No, sir. Pull yourself together, new cadet, he yelled. The new cadet struggled to his feet. Listen, bonehead, take the steps one at a time and move out in a military manner, keeping your forearms parallel to the ground and stay on that wall. Now get out of here. Yes, sir, he answered and started pounding up the stairs with his arms out in front of him, looking like Frankenstein's monster on a homicidal rampage. I bit my lip to keep from laughing. He said forearms, not arms. The troll stepped in front of me. Are you laughing at your classmate, miss? Do you find this amusing? You think you're better than he is? No, sir. Wipe that nasty smirk off your face. You make me sick. Do you actually think you're going to somehow make it through this place on your own? That you're going to skate by without making any mistakes? From what I've heard, you've made plenty of mistakes already, he snorted. You'll probably be the first to go. At least this guy here is trying. He thrust his face into mine and whispered, Personally, miss, I don't think you've got what it takes to make it here. His words so similar to my mother's cut into me, making me flinch. I swallowed. Hello? Are you having a brain cramp or are you just stupid? What did he want me to do? No, sir, I... No, you're not having a brain cramp or no, you're not stupid. I felt trapped. Sir, I... The troll shook his head with disgust. Just get your sorry unmilitary ass out of my AO. Post. Yes, sir, I yelled. I didn't want to catch any more of the kind of abuse he was dishing out. He stepped aside to let me pass. I charged up the stairs and made it to the third floor unscathed. On the landing, I hesitated. Now what? Oh, what did the cadet in the red sash say? I chanced a quick look to my left, then right. Thank God. No cadets were around right then, but the stairwell was anything but quiet. Come on, left or right? 
The door to my left was wide open, so I hurried through it and was confronted with a long hallway. Closed doors lined one side. The other side, the side I was on, was bare. Loud voices filled the hall, coming from a mob at its far end. On instinct, I moved along the wall in the direction of the noise until the mob, a long line of stuttering new cadets, blocked my way. Shouting upper-class cadets swarmed around them like bargain hunters at an after-Christmas sale. Stay on that wall. Do not speak unless spoken to. No gazing around. You thinking of buying this place? The reason for the traffic jam became clear as the loudest cadet of them all shouted, Get your beady eyes off of me and memorize that sign, snacks. Gawk at it like it's your best friend's girlfriend. I had a sudden urge to run, to escape this nightmarish place, but where would I go? So I just looked over the heads in front of me at the white sign hanging down from the ceiling in the middle of the hall and mouthed the words spelled out in black letters. Salute. Sir, new cadet blank, reports to the first sergeant of hotel company, cadet basic training for the first time as ordered. And then I remembered what the cadet in the red sash had said my next task would be, to report to the first sergeant of H company. A cadet yanked me from my spot on the wall as I was memorizing the sign and shoved me towards a closed door. Did you understand the sign, smack? Yes, sir. Good. Knock three times, wait until the first sergeant tells you to enter and report, and leave your bag outside. Got that, smack? Yes, sir. Knock three times, leave the bag. I knocked three times, knock, knock, knock. Enter, boomed a voice from behind the door. I opened the door and peeked inside. Who are you? screamed the red-faced cadet with hair the color of peach fuzz sitting behind a desk. Little Bo Peep, he glared at me from behind gold-wired frame glasses and hissed. When I say enter, you will walk into the room with a sense of purpose. Stop three paces from my desk and report. Now get out of here and try it again. I fled through the door, pulling it shut behind me, and knocked three times again, louder this time. Enter. I marched up to his desk, saluted, and yelled, Sir, new Cadet Davis reports to the first sergeant of hotel company, cadet basic training for the first time as ordered. Phew. He stared at me for what seemed like two and a half days. A clock ticked somewhere in the room. My grandparents collected clocks, and when I slept at their house, the clocks all over the house joined together to lull me to sleep with their gentle ticking. The sound didn't fit in this sweltering, inhospitable place. The first surgeon finally saluted in slow motion and whispered, Are you scared, new cadet? Am I scared? My stomach was trying to pass for a pretzel and my mouth for a desert, but no way would I tell him that. No, sir. He slowly lifted himself up, slammed his chair against the wall behind him, and leaned over the desk and whispered, Oh yeah? You sure look scared, new cadet. I felt my lip tremble and I bit it quick to make it quit. His eyes narrowed. Your mom was waiting for you outside. Wanna go home? That was probably the best thing he could have said to me. If he had made me a different offer, any other offer, I might have taken him up on it. But the thought of getting back into that blue station wagon, back onto 202 Lincoln Drive, a quitter. Back to my mother's, I told you so's. No. Any place but home. I clenched my fists and shouted, No, sir! He studied me thoughtfully. Then he reached under his desk, retrieved a green book, and slammed it onto his desk. I jumped. He snickered, then roared, Sign in, smackhead. Name, date, time, class. Yes, sir. I staggered up to his desk and took his pen. Left-handed, huh? That's just another strike against you, smack. My hand shook as I began to write my name. D. A. Scratch, scratch. I gulped. The pen wouldn't write. Get your nasty elbow off my desk, grub ball. I don't want your arm hairs touching my desk again. I tried again. Scratch, scratch, scratch. Nothing. What's your major malfunction, bonehead? You trying to grow a brain? Sir, I... This... This pen is... Um... I looked up at him. His hands shot down, grabbed the pen out of my hand, and threw it against the wall. You are trying my patience, miss. He slammed another pen down on the desk. Right! My shaking fingers formed the correct letters. Davis, Andrea, June 28th, 2004. I looked at my watch. 1109. I could feel his eyes drilling into my head. Class, 2004. The first sergeant spun the book around. Then his head sprang up, fire dancing behind the wireframe glasses, spreading to his cheeks, his ears, down his neck. What?! I had never heard anyone yell so loud in my life. What is this, miss? He cursed, making my mother's angry words sound like the sentimental mush on Hallmark cards. He jabbed his finger up and down onto the book until I thought only a hole would remain where my 2004 was written. He leaned over the desk until his wire-framed face was so close to mine I could smell his breakfast, eggs and coffee, as he hissed. Six weeks ago, 1,000 men and women sat in Mitchie Stadium, ending four long years of sleepless nights, grueling days, area tours, cow English, baked scrod, CORs, the IOC, and justice PRs. I bit my lip. 
what in the world is he talking about? They gave their sweat, blood, and tears to earn the right to be called the class of 2004. Do you dare equate yourself to them? N -n -n no sir, I croaked, clutching at the fabric of my shorts. He snatched the pen from off his desk where I had left it, and with bold strokes crossed out the 2004 and scrawled 2008 in its place. Then he turned his eyes to a pile of papers on his desk. New Cadet Davis, you are in 3rd Squad, 3rd Platoon, Room 305. Your squad leader is Cadet Daly. My body went cold. I remembered Cadet Daly, and he said he'd remember me too. The first sergeant looked at me again and yelled, What squad, maggot? Somehow my vocal cords defrosted enough for me to shout, Sir, I am in 3rd Squad, 3rd Platoon, whatever that is. The whites of his eyes became my whole world. Are you scared now, new cadet? He whispered. No, sir, I shouted, my voice shaking like I had been injected with 50 shots of espresso. Only fools don't fear the enemy, new cadet, he said, and I'm the enemy. My eyes followed his finger to his name tag, where the white letters S-T-O-C-K-E-L etched into the black plastic seemed to mock me. Cadet Stockel opened his mouth and bellowed, post. I flew out the door where the next victim was already waiting. Report to your room, new cadet. I heard some other upper class cadets say to me and deposit your gear, then report to the cadet in the red sash. And no gazing around, do you understand? Yes, sir, I said. I sped along the bare wall away from the growing throng of new cadets that's mouthing the words on the sign. I tried to catch the room numbers out of the corner of my eye after I passed door after closed door on the opposite side of the hall. Random thoughts whipped through my mind. Sir, I am in third squad, third platoon room, 305. The first sergeant is my enemy. Cadet Daly is my squad leader. The cadet in the red sash winked at me and I look like I'm scared. I am a dirtbag, a bonehead, a stupid, pea brain, stinking carcass knucklehead. I dared to equate myself to the class of 2004. I have four responses. My name is Davis. I slither like a snake. Room 305. I cross the hall and opened a solid oak door. No locks, no keys. I shut out the clamor of the hallway, dropped my bag, and leaned against the door. I squeezed my eyes shut and took deep breath after deep breath until I finally stopped shaking. 